Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live World Lion Day event. Today is about celebrating lions and introducing you all to some of the most inspiring leaders out there, people who've really dedicated their lives to protecting lions, their landscapes, species they share those with. Um, and it's about introducing the reality as well about what it's like to live alongside lions, the challenges that come with keeping this apex predator from, from blinking out. Uh, my name is Paul Thompson. I'm the Director of Conservation Programs at the Wildlife Conservation Network. We are based in San Francisco, where I'm uh, reporting from live, uh, and we support field conservationists all over the world, including dozens of lion conservation groups who are part of our network. Um, and it's really a great pleasure for me to be here to be the host of today's event. It's super humbling because the people we will be speaking with are just so impressive, smart, and they're, they're just good people, as you're about to find out. Um, first, I want to thank and beyond for hosting today's event. Um, this is such a world class company, and it's been really fun putting this together with them. And if you've attended some of the live events in the past, I think you know that they really know how to put on a great virtual event in this day and age. And also a big shout out to all of our speakers for taking time uh, from their very busy lives and jobs to join us today. So one of the messages you're gonna be hearing again and again today is that lions are billed as you know, one of the most powerful predators in the world, but they're in a very fragile state. So you're gonna be hearing about the threats facing them across the continent of Africa and how we've lost half of all lions in just the past couple of decades and how the challenge of saving them is gonna be extremely difficult, but it's, it's not gonna be impossible. So I know many of you who are tuning in are avid travelers yourselves, you're conservationists perhaps, uh, maybe you've visited Africa many times, you've seen lions a number of times, or maybe that safari is just still out there in the distant future on your bucket list. Either way, I think today you're in for a treat. We're going to explore different aspects of lions and their conservation. Um, and along the way, we want to hear from you. So, so there's a chat feature on the side of your screen. Please say hello, say where you're calling in from, um, and then ask some questions because there will be time at the end uh, to have a group discussion and to try to get to some of your questions. So without further ado, I would like to bring up our first guest, and I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Peter Lindsay, who's going to help sort of set the context for the scene today. Uh, Peter is a colleague of mine at the Wildlife Conservation Network. He leads the Lion Recovery Fund. So he basically has the dream job where he gets to travel the continent, um, meeting with some of the most impressive lion experts around and helping support their work so that they can do their job. Pete, welcome to the screen. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I, sh I should mention that Pete is proudly Zimbabwean and uh, I believe today he's, he's on the road, so he's calling in from Tanzania. But uh, Pete, welcome. So maybe kick things off by just uh, setting the scene for us. So you work continent-wide, so what's the current state of lions in Africa? Okay, I'm not getting Pete's audio. It seems like there's a bit of a delay. And then uh, I don't know if somebody can unmute Pete or Pete, if you can. I, there we go. We're in business. It seemed I was uh, defeated by the mute button. <laughs> so uh, hi, good to see you, Paul. Um, yeah, greetings everyone from Tanzania. Um, yeah, you asked me about the status of, of lions. So there are a vexing species in a, in a sense because in the in the most popular most visited wildlife areas in africa they're quite visible and, and common and easy to see and so that kind of masks the fact that the populations are really struggling so we estimate that over the last 25 years or so between the release of the first lion king movie and the second lion king movie they declined by about 50 percent and presently they occupy somewhere between six and eight percent of their historic range. 
So, so tell us more about why, what's leading to that huge drop in numbers? Well, in many senses, lions are the, the victim of the developmental changes that are happening in Africa. It's a continent that's changing at pace. Human populations are growing very quickly. The continent's developing. Land is being converted for agriculture and settlement. People are moving into previously wild landscapes. Livestock populations are increasing. And all of these, all of these issues create pressures on, on wild ecosystems. But if more specifically, lions are affected by, we could say, threats that cause the death of, of lions. So things like retaliatory killing by livestock keepers, um, the death of lions in traps and snares, have customary traditional hunting of lions and emerging poaching of lions for their body parts. Then there are threats that cause decline in their prey populations. So this is caused, for example, by the bushmeat trade where people hunt wildlife for meat. Um, there's also competition between wild prey and livestock. And then lastly, there's the destruction of habitats. So the habitats that lions and their prey depend upon. So you and I were recently on a trip to the Serengeti where we got exposed firsthand to some of those threats facing lions, especially around snaring for bushmeat. And I think this is kind of an, a thing that many people haven't yet really heard much about is, is what is the bushmeat trade and how much of a threat um, is bushmeat poaching for, and what is bushmeat poaching and how much of it is a threat to lions? Yeah, yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Paul. Break up a little bit there. But um, yeah, bushmeat poaching is, is a huge threat to, to wildlife in Africa and to lions specifically. We did a, a survey of, of about 190 protected area managers um, two years ago, and we asked them, you know, what are the, the main threats facing wildlife in, in the areas that they manage? And the bushmeat trade emerged as the most frequent and most severe threat. So what the bushmeat trade is, is, is it basically revolves around illegal hunting or poaching of wildlife for, for meat, for local consumption or sale. And it affects lions in two, two ways. So the first is that the traps and snares that are used to catch animals for meat also catch lions. So lions are often killed in these traps and snares. And then secondly, if, if prey populations decline, which they do if bushmeat hunting is allowed to continue without being controlled, then lion populations decline in very short order. So bushmeat poaching is the main reason why in, in a lot of Africa, if you don't actively protect wildlife, it, it disappears. So what, what's being done? Sort of what are some of the strategies kind of across the continent? Before we get into the specifics of the work you do with the Lion Recovery Fund, tell us like what are some of the broad strategies that need to be done to, to help bring back clients? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's a need to, um, generally speaking, there's a need to greatly increase the available funding for, for conservation. That's a, that's a kind of overriding need that, that affects affects everything that, that we do and all, all conservationists do. But generally speaking, it's a, it's a combination of trying to manage the areas that have been set aside for wildlife effectively and to protect them and to undertake anti-poaching and, and, and those kind of suite of interventions. And then secondly, interventions to work with local people to create allies for conservation and to make conservation and, and wildlife work for local people so, so that people are supportive of and, and, and not antagonistic towards conservation efforts. So broadly speaking, those are the two categories of intervention that are required. Great. So if you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Peter Lindsay from the Lion Recovery Fund. Uh, Pete, tell us a little bit about the Lion Recovery Fund and, and how it works and, and uh, how it's sort of providing some some positive outlook for lions across the continent. Yeah, thank, thanks, Paul. So the Lion Recovery Fund was formed in 2017. So it's, uh, it's actually today is our fourth birthday, the Lion Recovery Fund's fourth birthday. So what we do is we raise funding from as many different sources as possible. And then we take 100% of the funds raised and we invest them according to a science-based strategy in the best ideas for protecting lions, their habitats, and their prey. So my job is that I have to look around the continent for the for those ideas, for the best projects out there. 
I, I then request proposals that are reviewed by a committee of conservation professionals who, who uh, assess the rigor of, of the um, proposals in, uh, in question. On this, on this slide there, you can see a, just the distribution of, of grants that we've made. So, so far, the Line Recovery Fund has invested just under 20 million US dollars uh, across 21 different countries and 162 different projects. So it's, we've, we've got off to a good start, but there's so much more still to do. So we're definitely not resting on our laurels. Great. And so, so just to end, um, do, you, do you have a, a hopeful outlook for Lions? Yeah, Paul, you know, it, there's no doubt that wildlife in Africa has got a tough, uh, a tough time ahead. Human populations are growing and the continent is developing. So it, it is going to be challenging. But the reasons for optimism. So firstly, the political will for conservation in Africa is very strong. Secondly, the continent has set aside huge areas for conservation, which is really, really impressive. Thirdly, lions breed very quickly if you protect them, their prey and their habitats. And lastly, we have the conservation interventions that we know work if we can raise enough funding to support them at scale. Cool. All right. Thank you, Pete. Um, Peter will join us later at the end of the session for a group discussion. But now I would like to welcome one of my favorite human beings to the screen, Tandiwe Mwitwa, who's project manager at the Zambia Carnivore Program. Uh, she's a National Geographic Explorer. And in her role as project manager, she works part research, part conservation, and then also manages uh, their conservation education program and has a pretty cool uh, program for getting more women involved in conservation, which we'll talk about. Tandy, welcome. Thanks for, for joining this event today. Um, just help set the scene for us. Tell us a little bit about uh, your work and the lions in Zambia. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. Lions are one of my favorite species and any celebration, any shape or form for lions is exciting for me. Um, yeah, so very briefly, um, I work with the Zambian Carnival Program in the eastern part of Zambia. And so if um, the slides are, uh, are ready, the first map just shows where we work as uh, ZCP. So we have three study sites in the country. One is in the eastern province where I am. Uh, another one is in the Kafue, and then also in Liwa Plains National Park out in the west. So we do research work on lions, trying to understand what are the threats and limiting factors to the species. Um, and so this enables us to have a finger on the pulse, so to speak, in terms of what's going on with lions in our area. And in this period of rapid human influence change on in landscapes and on ecosystems, it's absolutely critical that this work is able to go on. Um, and then when it comes to being able to do this type of work in unique landscapes, but following the same methodology, we're able to have a case study, almost based approach to research, and it's been uh, quite eye-opening. We have the same species across three lands, landscapes, but affected by multiple different issues. Um, and then we're also able here where we work in the in, in the Luangwa Valley, we're able to do studies on lion prides that live in both national parks and um, outside in the game management areas where they come into contact with people. So we're then able to understand what are the threats these animals are facing and then what can we do uh, when it comes to conservation interventions that can limit um, you know, the impact of lions on communities and then also communities on African lions. So yeah, briefly, that's kind of research work that we're, that we're doing. And then, so tell us a little bit about the lion numbers in South Luangwa. Are they stable? Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? What's happening? Because I'm sure some of our of people watching maybe have visited that landscape. Yes, so South Luangwa is considered at the moment to have Zambia's largest population of African lions. So at the moment, you know, we, we have what seems to be a stable population, but then things can change very quickly. 
Um, and that's why we have these ongoing studies to understand what is happening to them and then what can we do to limit that impact. Uh, one thing that Peter, uh, Peter touched on earlier that tends to affect these large numbers, we believe, is wire snaring. Um, we had, uh, going into the pandemic, we had huge fears that we just going to see numbers shoot up. Luckily, in 2020, we had very um, little evidence of that. But then come 2021, we've, you know, had incidents already. So it just shows how things can change very quickly. But yeah, we've got a good uh, population here that we're, we're monitoring, we're estimating for the whole valley, um, you know, around between 500 and 700 individuals. So uh, tell us a little bit about your program that you have that inspires young people to get more involved in conservation. So tell us about the program and what are you finding? Are more Africans getting into this line of work? Um, we have a program that is aimed at introducing young people to careers in wildlife conservation. And so this takes a number of different shapes and forms. We start with conservation club students. So these are between the ages of between 13 and 18 years old. So we take them out into the park, they get to experience the wildlife, but then we also want them to appreciate the role of research in conservation in general. So they carry out these many different projects, um, you know, with camera apps, with different uh, cool, simple instruments. And hopefully, you know, we get some that are motivated enough to join the field later. And then beyond high school, we've got different programs that are targeted at, you know, young conservation biologists in the making. We've got different programs that provide opportunities for young women to join the field because it's one thing knowing about the presence of a certain career that we can follow and another uh, getting out there and getting a taste for what it's like. And yeah, we've got a, another different program for wildlife veterinary students that are interested in getting out in the field and then finding out what it is like to work with live and breathing wild dogs or African lions. So it's a whole range. And yeah, we've gotten a lot of interest and that has just been growing and growing. And we've been very lucky to be able to partner with different organizations organizations and government agencies to burden this further. So it's exciting times. Yeah, definitely. And and so what about you? When you were a kid, did you ever imagine that you would end up chasing lions around and being a leader for the next generation of, of lion conservationists? <laughs> I never imagined I'd be here. Um, but yeah, it took, I think, a moment uh, with lions out in the wild up close, hearing them just going full volume, roaring and um, just being completely fascinated and blown away by these incredible creatures to be like, okay, I'm in the right place. This is what I want to do uh, from now on. And it's a great, great privilege. I think we saw that countdown, nothing beats that sound in the wild. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you for joining us today to celebrate these lions. Um, thank you for doing all the work you do. Uh, I'd like to bring up our next guest, uh, Ingela Janssen. I'm very excited to, to speak with you today. So Ingela and her team, Cope Lion, they work in one of the most iconic landscapes in Africa. So the Ngorongoro Conservation Area, which is in northern Tanzania, not far from the Serengeti. Many people watching are probably familiar with this area. You've been working in the greater Serengeti ecosystem since 2006. Um, today, you're, you're joining us from your home country of Sweden, where you're working really hard to finish your PhD. Um, so thanks for, for putting that aside for a minute to join us to talk about lions. Ingela, um, perhaps, you know, tell us a little bit about your amazing work that is focusing on working with local communities who live alongside lions. And perhaps you can start by telling us about some of the cultural relationship between Maasai and lions to sort of help set the, set the scene for us. 
Right. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, very exciting to be here uh, and to join this, uh, this conversations here. So important. Um, yeah, so I, uh, the, the area that you describe in Gorongoro is, um, is a place where uh, that was gazetted, set aside for um, as a multi-use landscape where a traditional pastoralists were permitted to continue living with abundant wildlife uh, and their livestock. And uh, um, so going back over millennia, probably uh, pastoralists have lived alongside um, big carnivores. And uh, um, be it that uh, their livelihood is based on livestock, uh, protecting their livestock is a, a number one duty, and especially so for, for the young uh, Morani, the young warriors. Um, and uh, one of the dangers to the livestock is uh, lions, um, a very immediate direct threat by attacking their, their livelihoods, by attacking their livestock. Um, and alongside that is, um, well, uh, also, the lion is very vulnerable to these. Um, if they kill a, a cattle, um, lion tend to linger by the by the prey, and so they are more vulnerable to the retaliatory killings that happens afterwards. Um, often, um, mostly the the killings happen by uh, direct spearing, sort of facing the lions and spearing it. Um, uh, besides that, uh, the uh, the Maasai have also um, sort of a cultural connection to lions and many of the other wildlife species where the lion is a, a feared and at the same time very admired um, animal. Um, it's a beast to live with uh, if you live alongside lions and you try to raise cattle. There is a massive fascination to this animal and uh, be it that uh, uh, the fear, the fearsome beast, being able to set a spear in that lion is really one of the prime uh, displays of bravery, bravery for a for a Maasai warrior. Um, so that's kind of the the relationship that is there. It's a it's an animal that uh, you kind of you live among it, uh, you live with it. Um, there is admiration, but there is also the great danger directly to your livelihood. And so tell us about the work that Cope Lion is doing uh, to promote that coexistence and, and maintain the ability for people to, to carry on their, their cultural traditions while living alongside that predator and keeping lions safe too. Mm. Yeah, so very much the, the work uh, that we started up uh, in 2011 is very much uh, inspired and building on the model, uh, the Lion Guardians model, where we uh, work directly with the Maasai communities um, and we employ uh, warriors, we employ young men from the warrior age set to work with cultural uh, duties that are uh, there to mitigate um, mitigate uh, conflicts between predators and uh, livestock. So part of their duties is to find, uh, search for and find lost livestock, um, uh, reinforce uh, uh, livestock corrals uh, that have been attacked by livestock or that are weak, to treat wounded livestock. Um, livestock don't all, always get killed by the predators. They, they often get just wounded. Um, and also to provide early warning. Uh, GPS, colored lines for us, has become a very important tool to, um, mm -hmm. to provide daily updates on the lines positions. Um, so engaging the people that sometimes are the ones that would have gone out killing the lions, now they're given the, the more challenging task of uh, protecting the lions as well as assisting their communities. Mm -hmm. And so, so just good old fashioned relationship building and building that trust with local communities must be key to doing all of that. Absolutely, uh, absolutely key to to in, engage with the communities, um, to acknowledge their skills in living in this environment, um, and at the same time also recognizing the the cost that these uh, large carnivores uh, incurs to the communities, and. Mm -hmm. On that, we are uh, now trialing um, a program, a conservation, um, a conservation incentive-based uh, program, 
whereby communities are um, receiving a benefit directly linking to the numbers of lions that are on their land. Still in its trial phase, much to learn, uh, but I also believe in, in recognizing the costs and being able to, uh, to provide some benefit back from, from the beasts. Right. If we want to keep lions alive, we've got to reduce that cost that local people bear living alongside them. Yeah, yeah. So I think so. A, a few days ago, a very terrible incident took place in your area. And I think that it really illustrates everything you're describing, including the, the, the most extreme cost of living with lions. Uh, so what happened? Yeah, it's probably one of the worst days that we've had. Uh, getting the news from one of our Ilchikuti, one of our staff on the ground, that uh, uh, four boys was attacked. This happened on the 3rd of August, um, so just a few days ago. Four boys attacked. Uh, three were killed and one was injured. He is recovering. Um, and the attack was done uh, at night, so it was well into the dark. Um, and it was by one lioness, um, is the information we have. And she was with uh, three um, sort of growing on a nearly uh, one-year-old cubs in the area. Um, it is a shock to us. And, the um, you know, it's nothing that we would expect in an area where People live alongside lions and, and you know, daytime uh, people feel, um, you know, kind of comfortable in the area because lions do not have the, the, um, the tendency at all to, to uh, attack people, to follow people. Unfortunately, at night, that becomes the time for the lions. And uh, we're still learning much from this event, um, but surely it has really... Um, shaken uh, the whole team the whole area and at the moment the the anger and the grief is very raw out there i bet i bet and so so how does your team respond in in a time like that so our big focus uh, in the in the days that follow and still today is to really be there, be on the ground and try to support the communities in the ways that we can. Um, it is transporting people to the hospitals, uh, supporting the families, um, carrying on the work that we always do. Um, the lines are still out there. So providing those daily um, uh, information, keeping the livestock safe, keeping the people safe. Um, and also uh, trying to work alongside the, the authorities in the areas, um, providing the facts as we know it, providing our experience and, and so helping out with our relation in the communities um, to try and find a solution, a solution that may be, you know, interventions. It may be uh, that there is uh, decisions for lethal control or for translocations. Um, and to be there and 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 kind of support both authorities and the communities in something that we're facing for the first time of, mm. at this scale. Yeah. Well, that's uh, I can't imagine how hard that is for the the families of the boys and the and the communities there as well as for your team. So, my heart's with you guys. Um, and unfortunately, we've got to move on. But thank you for, yeah. for sharing that. And, and, and Thanks, folks, folks watching, if you have more questions about Ingle's work and this incident or anything, please put, put your questions in the chat. We will have an opportunity to come back at the end for some more follow up. But Ingle, for now, thank you very much. much. And uh, I would like to bring up our next guest. We have Simon Naylor, who is the manager of the Pinda Reserve in South Africa. Simon's got decades of hands-on experience uh, with conservation and is a true expert in wildlife management. Um, I think your reach extends not just to lions, but also with rhinos, elephants, cheetahs. Uh, it's great to have you on screen today, Simon. Welcome. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks. It's great to be here. Good. So, so Simon, you live on Pinda and you work on Pinda, which is such an incredible piece of land. Um, it's almost like a, a private national park. So perhaps start by telling us a little bit about what it's like to actively manage lions on a private game reserve. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, look, it's it's uh, listening to the the previous um, sort of speakers. Um, it's it's I think South Africa is um, you know had a slightly different um, sort of history of line line management, and it's it's the 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 role that lions have played in, in, in South African conservation is, is slightly different and the challenges that we face. I think Pinda is a, um, much like many other reserves in South Africa, is, is quite unique in that if I, well, I, I pulled, if I can pull up a map to show you, just to give you some sort of context of, of lion management or lion conservation in, in South Africa, um, the picture is quite quite different um, to the rest of Africa. You know, up until about 50 years ago, there, you know, there weren't actually many lions left in South Africa. Most of them were wiped out, you know, by agriculture and hunting. And um, and the only lions that were sort of wild, you know, wild lions left in South Africa were in the Kruger National Park, which is sort of that red, large red sort of space on the on the right, and the Khalekhadi, which is in the Kalahari. Um, it was only sort of 30, 40 years ago that, um, you know, land was was set aside for for conservation and lions were reintroduced back into these uh, these areas where they used to occur. And 30 years ago, where, where I am now in Pinda, um, and, and, and that's kind of what's happened in South Africa is a lot of private reserves have sort of popped up for tourism mostly. Um, and so you have these sort of islands of of lion conservation and lion populations. So as, as with Pinda, there's many, many of these reserves which are contain these sort of fenced in lion populations. And, and that's that's why you know we we manage lions very, very intensively. Um, you know, you've got these small populations which which you have to sort of uh, like anything wild uh, in a small confined space, you've got to manage quite intensively. So um, you know, Pinda was one of the first reserves to reintroduce lions into an area or to restore an area back to what it was. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's where I've been now for the last 15 years, managing these lions. And so was the objective of Pinda to be a takeoff site for lions into other areas of Africa? No, not no, no, not at all. I mean, the objective to, to bring lions back was obviously to, to restore um, species that went extinct, you know, into the reserve. And um, but what's quite unique uh, to lion conservation or lion management in, in South Africa, especially in these fenced off reserves, you know, you've you've got these islands of of, of lions, and so they you have very little natural mortality. Um, being a fenced reserve, you have very little human wildlife conflict. So there's, you know, lions are not sort of leaving the parks uh, that much. Um, and so the challenges that we face are actually Funny enough, very different to the rest of Africa. Uh, the populations grow. I mean, Peter um, highlighted the fact that lions breed very quickly. So if you take away their their natural predation, um, like hyenas and, and other male lions, um, they breed very rapidly. And so the challenge that we face in South Africa in a lot of these small reserves is uh, having too many lions. And so I think that's what happened uh, at Pinda very, very quickly on. Um, you know, we ended up, exceeding the carrying capacity of the lions that we have. And so we've had to develop sort of techniques or ways to reduce that that number. And so translocation is just one option that we have um, to maintain a sort of a, a natural uh, number of lions in the, in the population. So, yeah, so we've been very fortunate at Pinda to, to be able to sort of move, uh, you know, lions to, to other parks, uh, not only in South Africa, but... But in, you know, we moved uh, lions to Rwanda, to Mozambique. Um, we've able to restore, you know, other areas of, of lion, you know, where, where um, you know, lions used to occur. Um, and so through, we've developed techniques to move these lions, as you can see there in that, in that photograph. And, um, yeah, so that's how we've managed to maintain the population. Um, so it wasn't the original intent to have lions at Pinda. But, um, yeah, that's a sort of a... Mm. Um, and I think that's the contribution that many of these smaller sort of fenced in reserves in South Africa have is they have the sort of excess of lions that they can move to other other places where perhaps they've gone extinct or um, they no longer occur. Um, and that's the contribution that we can make to lion conservation in the rest of Africa.
So then let's talk genetics. Uh, keeping that genetic integrity of lions must be a priority when you're doing that type of management. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you how you approach that, the genetic integrity aspect of it. Yeah, look, again, you know, I think South Africa is quite unique. Um, you know, as I showed in that earlier map, you've got lots of these small populations. So there is a very high risk that if we don't manage um, these populations carefully, there's the risk of inbreeding. And we all know that inbreeding is, is obviously not good for, for a population's health. Um, so we've actually formed a, a forum in South Africa called the Lion Management Forum, which is a sort of a group of like-minded um, conservation reserves. And, um, you know, we, we, we manage this population of South African lions as a meta population. So, you know, these lions can't move naturally and disperse naturally. And so we have to, yeah, we have to sort of move them um, ourselves. So we, we often bring new lions in and we take lions, male lions out just to ensure that we don't uh, have inbreeding in the in in the in the populations, and uh, together with other reserves, we we've done you know we do studies on the genetics just to ensure that you know the the, the populations are not inbred or, or, or inbreeding, should I say? So, so there's just an example. Yeah. So how we collect uh, sort of uh, genetic samples is um, you know we 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 either take blood or. Here's an example of, of us collecting biopsy um, or skin samples. So we'll we'll dart a line with a biopsy dart. I mean, it it it's like a um, you know just a sting in the in the bum, um, and we collect the the skin of of these lines and we send it for analysis. And so that enables us to sort of look at the hetero, heterozygosity of of the lion populations to ensure. And that that little sort of graph you see at the top there is our population here at Pinda. Um, which I, I can add is, is sort of one of the most diverse populations in South Africa. And, and a lot of other reserves have followed suit. And so we, we just ensure that the, uh, the genetics are, are, are healthy, for, for want of a better word. Okay, great. Wow. So, okay, Simon, how many lions do you think you've translocated or moved around in your time? Um, sure. We've done, yeah, in excess of 100, hey? Um I mean, the Pinda population has done very well. I mean, we've had probably oof, over 200 births, you know, 70, I think it's about 70 odd litters. Um, and so we've moved a lot of lines right throughout South Africa. Um, as I said, we've moved lines to Mozambique, to Rwanda, um, you know. So, yeah, I mean, we've, we've um, and obviously Pinda's expanded as well. So we've, we've, we've managed to slow down, you know, um, you know, the larger, the larger the area, the the less lines we have to sort of manage. Um, yeah, so we've yeah over the last thirty years we've been busy, very busy. All right, thanks so much, Simon. Um, we'll bring you back on later when we have a group discussion at the end. But right now, I would like to welcome Jean Jean Lobeschakni up from uh, there. You are. Hey, Jean. Uh, welcome. Happy World Lion Day to you. So. Uh, Jean is Jean works for an organization called African Parks. Uh, she's the director of conservation development and assurance. And if you're not familiar with African Parks, it's a fantastic conservation organization that manages protected areas like national parks across of Af Africa um, in collaboration with governments and surrounding communities. And Jean. In your role, you're responsible for new project development and ensure, assuring organizational consistency um, across the, the, the programs. Uh, you live in Johannesburg at the headquarters for African Parks, and, uh, and you've just been from, I think you've just come back from South Sudan. So, welcome. Thank you very much. And it's really great to be on this call with everyone. Yeah, we're, we're happy to have you. Um, okay, so Jean, we're getting such a great picture of different lion issues and, and landscapes across Africa. I think when, when a lot of people think of lions, they sort of imagine them in landscapes like the Serengeti or in the Kruger. Um, but tell us a little bit about what the situation is in West and Central Africa. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, just to, to give a bit of an intro of, of some of the populations that we are working with in those more remote areas, um, broadly speaking, that Sudano-Sahelian belt, um, we've got 
kind of down in the in the south southeast and orange spot there is Garamba National Park in northeast and DRC, which has a which has a lion population. Um, Chinko, just to the northwest of that in eastern Central African Republic. Um, Zakuma and Sinyaka Mania in southeastern Chad, and then the very important, um, what they call the, the, the WAP complex, so W. Arli Penjari. It's a, it's a transfrontier conservation area across Benin, Burkina Faso, and Niger. Um, and we're currently working on the, in the two parks on the Benin side. Um, and I mean, a little bit like Simon was explaining, especially in West Africa, you know, just having these really kind of isolated pockets of lion left. Um, but I think, yeah, that gives us a broad overview of some of those those populations. And I think just to of of those to really highlight the ones in the WAP complex, um, the current estimates are just under 200 lions in the WAP, which basically constitutes over 80 percent of the remaining lion in West Africa. Um, and you know, there's just so few areas left that are intact and at scale in West Africa because of that, you know, human population footprint and the development that Peter Lindsay was explaining earlier. Um, so that WAP, that WAP complex is just vital for the kind of long term success of, of, of lion in West Africa. And so what are the sort of more unique challenges facing lions um, in West Africa and sort of what are the threats out there? So I think the, you know, the, the threats in, in the central and the West, it's a little bit different to a lot of the, the more specific threats that you have for lion in, in East and Southern Africa, you know, like um, lions being killed as a result of human wildlife conflict, um, as a result of snaring, um, you know, for body parts, that does happen in Central and West Africa. But because of the low lion numbers and these vast areas, you know, incredibly remote, um, the threats that that we are facing in Central and West Africa are much are more global and systemic. Um, I would say so. You know, just breakdown in governance. Um, high insecurity, especially in, in the WAP complex in DRC and CAR, uh, Central African Republic. Um, you know, that high levels of poverty, um, a lot of, there, there is the, 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 a lot of pastoralism happening. So you do have conflict, not per se direct human wildlife conflict always, but just, you know, a lot of armed groups moving through, a lot of poaching happening. Um, and, and lion are often a byproduct of those threats. Um, but I would say just that broader kind of breakdown in governance, remote um, areas makes managing, managing these places very difficult. And, and that in itself is, is a, a sort of, it, it is a threat, but, but not always a direct one to lions specifically. Yeah. So, so because you're talking about uh, places where there isn't necessarily a lot of tourism, um, people might not be f as familiar with these landscapes. So tell us a little bit about uh, African Parks' approach in places like that, like, for example, uh, the WAP complex. Um, yeah, what's your approach there? Yeah, so I think for those who are not familiar with African Parks, um, we're an organization which essentially takes on the full responsibility for the management and restoration of protected areas in partnership um, with African governments and communities. Um, so we do that through a long-term management agreement with the government partner. Um, and currently are managing 19 areas in, in 11 different countries in the continent, which covers about 14.7 million hectares. Um, and it's, it's basically a holistic approach to conservation or to protection of these areas. Um, it's, not, it's not only looking at one aspect such as research or, or technical advice, but it's looking at managing the whole protected area, including all the elements to that. Um, so law enforcement and anti-poaching, community development, tourism development, um, infrastructure being put in place. Um, so it's, it's, it's all the activities that are needed to ensure that a protected area can be sustainably managed um, and ultimately become sustainable on both an ecological, a financial and a social perspective. Um, so I think, you know, 
along with, with kind of that holistic approach and all of the activities that that entails in each of the areas that we work in, um, a lot of work in these more remote areas where the lion populations are very low relative to a lot of the East and Southern African areas is, is, is doing a lot of work to understand the populations better. So that can be through call out surveys where, you know, where we, we, we do calls to try and attract lion in to count them because they're obviously very difficult to see during aerial surveys. Um, we also do um, a lot of collaring, uh, fitting the lines with, with satellite tracking collars. Um, you know, in Zakuma, for example, we've in, in Chad, we've got seven lion collared. We've got one lion who's gone sort of 40 kilometers south way out of the national park. Um, and we're actually then able to, to support um, if there are communities in that area, um, but also to know where to, to place wildlife ranges on patrol based on kind of key or high lion use zones or in areas where they potentially will have conflict. Um, so there's definitely a lot of specific activities that we are also doing above and beyond kind of that holistic approach to to the protection of yeah of, of the entire park essentially yeah, yeah definitely um so we're, we're we're almost out of time but just leave us with maybe an example of where you've seen good success for lions by taking on that very holistic approach towards a protected area so i think one um, one really key or two of the key ones in this region have been have been the WAC complex where we've seen a really positive increase over the last few years um, since we've been working there. But then also in Chinko in Eastern CAR um, in 2012, essentially when South Sudan split from Sudan, a lot of the pastoralists who were using so the southern part of Sudan for grazing um, started actually coming into Central African Republic because, because the country split and they could no longer go into South Sudan. Um, and there was a massive drop in, in lion population basically after 2012 as a result of poaching. Um, and those numbers have almost reached pre-2012 levels again over the past um, six, seven years that African Parks has been working in Chinko. And then I think just lastly, quickly, and it's a little bit linked to what Simon was speaking of earlier, we've also done some really wonderful translocations within African parks, um, taking lions back to, to Akagira, which actually came from Pinda um, in Rwanda. So, so that, that saw essentially lion, which hadn't been seen in Akagira in Rwanda for 15 years before we reintroduced them in 2015. Um, from seven animals, they're now up at an estimated 36. So that's a really great success story. And then similar stories in, in Malawi and national parks there, actually through support of, of Lion Recovery Fund, um, with, with both Liwandi and Majeti now, now having good, good, strong populations as a result of conservation activities, but also translocation. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, it's, it's incredible work you all are doing, not just in West and Central Africa, but across the continent. So thank you. All right, at this point, we are going to transition into a panel discussion with all the cast of characters I've been speaking with. So pulling everybody back up onto the screen, we are now for the next uh, few minutes, we're gonna take some questions from the audience. So we've got a few already in the chat. And again, if you do have additional questions for the team here, please put them in the chat and we'll uh, try to get them up here. I have been loving this. I've decided that I think we should have World Lion Day every month so that we can get on screen and just talk about lions. Um, it's been an amazing big picture uh, illustration of what's happening for lions in, in different landscapes and using different strategies towards lion conservation. So the first question, I think, Tandy, I think you've got a fan club out there because the first question is from someone named I Love Tandy. And <laughs> I want in on that fan club. Um, but it seems like this question might in fact be for Simon. Um, it's about lion relocation and the process behind it. So how does that actually work? And where are the lions uh, relocated from and where are they going to? So perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that process. Yeah, okay, um, I'll give it a shot. 
but uh, I mean, look, there's many, many reasons for, for moving lines. And I think that's sort of the main thing is what is the objective? I think if, if they're going to an area where they went extinct or um, no longer occur, I think it's important to, to, to ensure that, um, you know, there's enough food for them. They, they'll be protected and, you know, they're monitored once they're there. I think the, um, the process itself is, is quite how far they're going to travel. Um, you know, lions, um, you know, if, you, if you're moving a close distance, you've got to immobilize them, first of all, and um, which requires, you know, expertise. You need a vet, um, you know, to, to dart them. And and then, obviously, they've got to be moved, you know, safely. And, and the welfare of, of lions is, is cr critical. You know, there's a lot of factors that can, um, you know, determine the outcome of, of, a, of a translocation. And so, you know, you've got to you've got to look at the distance they travel, where they're going. Um, you know, the cost. Uh, some lions, you know, have travelled around the world. You know, but for example, the lions that we moved to to Rwanda. Um, you know, the journey was was sort of uh, it was about 24 hours. You know, they spent a lot of time in the boma here at Pinda before they left, just to acclimatise. Um, you know, before the move, and and then and then they were sort of put into uh, custom crates. Um, loaded on a truck, taken to the airport. They had had to clear customs, and then there was a sort of a plane journey to to Kigali. Then they were sort of put on another truck, uh, moved to Akagera, placed in a boma there. You know, again for acclimatization, and then uh, eventually released. You know, so so yeah. It, it I mean, there's so many factors involved, um, and I think over the years though, we've we've managed to sort of uh, really um, you know, make sure that all all translocations are very successful. And and again, I mean, the the welfare of these lines is 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 the most important thing. But yeah, I don't know if that answered the question. No, that did. Thank you, Simon. Um, so we have a, another audience question, and this one is going to you, Ingela. Uh, how do you reintroduce lions into Ngorongoro, or at least how are we sort of working to bring numbers back there? Um, and perhaps tell us a little bit more about what the population is like in terms of numbers, movements, um, and mm -hmm. just sort of context there. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so in Ngorongoro, the conservation area itself is a fairly large area at um, 8,300 square kilometers. Um, and in there, you have uh, two uh, like dense subpopulations, one being the very famous one in the Ngorongoro crater. Uh, the other population with high numbers is uh, right at the border of the Serengeti, the Ndutu lion population. Um, so with including those uh, two populations, we have about 130 lions uh, in the Ngorongoro conservation area. And um, so we do not, uh, nor do the authorities uh, work with any um, sort of intervention with the lions there. Instead, um, our approach to reintroducing lions is uh, uh, kind of um, um, building up a safer environment for the lions by working with the communities, increasing tolerance so that lions uh, can move by, the, by themselves, essentially, and uh, using the tract between the crater to the Ndutu area, which is across the, the, uh, the shared landscape with the pastoralist and livestock. Um, so that the lions can naturally disperse over that area. Um, and especially important will be um, um, some introduction of, of new uh, lions into the Ngorongoro crater, which over time has become more and more isolated um, by lions just not surviving the track uh, to the nearby Serengeti. Mm. Serengeti is basically two days track away from, from the crater. So, so okay, I've got a, a question for you, Ingela, on that point, but also, Tandy, I think I want to hear from you on this, too. Um, so, Ingela, you earlier you mentioned uh, putting GPS tracking collars on lions in your area to sort of tr see their movements and also provide like an early warning system to local communities. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you uh, select the lions that get collared? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we uh, we almost only put collars on the lions that are found in the multi-use landscape. 
um, we have some lines in the crater uh, where we deployed colors, but only because we knew that line was likely to spend most of the time out in the multi-use area. Um, getting lions in the multi-use area is incredibly difficult. Uh, they're very shy uh, and the terrain is tricky. So there, we don't target a specific individual. Um, if we do hear about lions in an area and we get a chance to collar, um, we do that. Um, and it can be a male or a female lion. It needs to be an adult. And uh, if we have a lion in one group collared, we are not interested to, to add another collar in that group unless the group is uh, uh, very many and, the, and we know that the lions are, are moving around in subgroups and causing a lot of conflicts. Mm. So very much kind of um, uh, thinking about the conflicts the lions are causing and targeting those individuals. Okay. Um, a question for you, Peter. Um, given the the scale at which lion conservation needs to take place to be successful, sort of how important is collaboration across different organizations uh, for that success? And then, are are you seeing that? Are you seeing increasing mm -hmm. collaboration among different groups? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, as you point out, because. Africa's, Africa's conservation state is so big. There's no one conservation organization that can do this alone. And so it's, it's really important that, that multiple conservation groups are involved. In many landscapes, it's, the areas are so big that, that it makes sense for a certain conservation group to work in part of it, and then another conservation group to work in another part. Collaboration is also important in terms of sharing ideas. And some groups are good at some things, and other groups are, are good at others. And so collaboration is absolutely essential. Um, we certainly are seeing quite a bit of collaboration in the conservation space. I think there's a, some pretty heartening collaborations going on. I think there could be more, and it's something the conservation community as a whole needs to, needs to work on. But um, generally speaking, I think things are pretty good. Yeah, okay. And so, Gene, you know, we, we, we spoke a lot about the holistic approach it takes to to protect these landscapes in order to protect lions. And I think, you know, we, we've heard a lot about sort of the research side of things, the wildlife management side of things, the community side of things, but you guys are working very closely with governments. So how important is it to engage governments and build that political will for lions? It's absolutely um, vital, um, you know, at the end of the day, these natural or these protected area networks are natural assets that belong to these governments, including, you know, the wildlife in them. Um, and while, you know, as an example with us, we, we form long-term management partnerships with government whereby they essentially delegate the responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of these areas. Um, we're ultimately custodians of, of this, the government's natural asset. Um, and for the long-term sustainability, that engagement with both the government partner, but also with the communities, as we've, as we've spoken about earlier, is, is so critical at kind of a local, at a regional, at a national level to, to build what we call a constituency for conservation, because that's ultimately how we are going to ensure in a, in a kind of world where human population is ever increasing, that, that hopefully we will we will continue to work towards that that kind of balance between people and wildlife by having that strong constituency in place yeah great so here's a question from alice dare and i think this one goes to you simon um tell us a little bit more about the lion population on pinda um yeah well we have we've got a We've got about 35 lines um, in three or four prides. Um, yeah, uh, and and yeah, I mean it fluctuates. Obviously, um, you know, if there's births, we have more, um, and if there's natural mortalities, we have we have less. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how it looks at the moment. Okay, great. So I had a question for Tandiwe, but she just, I think we're having some technical <laughs> difficulties with her. So we're just going to wait until she is back on. Um, 
Tell us, okay, I have a question about the role of tourism in conservation. So I'm not quite sure who would like to take that, but I, uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how important and what those ties are between tourism and lion conservation. Simon, do you want to start with that yeah. one? Given, uh, yeah. Um, well, I can maybe I, let me speak for sort of Pinda and, and South Africa. I think tourism um, has played a huge role in, uh, you know, lion conservation and, and the increase of lion numbers in, in South Africa. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of 30 years ago, there weren't that many lions in South Africa. Um, and, you know, after the elections in, 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 in the early 90s, there was a sort of a boom of, of tourism and there was a lot of restoration of, of previous farmland into sort of tourism, five-star sort of uh, ecotourism lodges, etc., and and that's that's really caused a um, a massive increase in lion numbers and lion populations, um, and I think I think it's it's unfortunately been overshadowed a lot by, you know, South Africa's is you know when you talk about lion lions in South Africa, everyone sort of talks about uh, canned lions and and the hunting of those lions, but but there's actually uh, you know there's about eight hundred to a thousand lions wild sort of uh, wild lions on these um, private reserves and state reserves. And that's all sort of really been um, uh, driven by tourism. And so, so yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's a, um, a significant impact that tourism has had in the last 30 years of, of lion conservation and, and the, the success of, um, of that is, is quite evident. Hmm. Jean, did you have something else to add to that point? No, I was just going to say that um, it's it's also a little bit of a two-way street with Lion because obviously tourism um, brings in revenue, which which enables these areas to be better managed and protected. But in a in a funny sort of round a route way, lions, being the charismatic species that they are, are also a big attractor of tourism if you have lion in a protected area especially where where they are kind of readily easily or easily seen um you know that that whole big five status in an area actually you know it does play a big part in kind of tourism um so but but you know that revenue is and obviously that's really been felt very very hard this year with and last year with covid um, you know, that loss of tourism revenue has had an enormous impact on, on a lot of conservation activities, including lion conservation activities in Africa. Great. Um, Ingela, we have a question here from Diana that is asking, mm -hmm. what is the average travel range for lions? What are you seeing in your area? Yeah, so uh, it really depends on if you're looking at... Uh, um, the individuals like females with cubs they're not going to move very far they're going to stay uh, nearby where they can reach the cubs every day uh, maybe they move a kilometer or two in a day um, a uh, we have a good example of a long a wide ranging uh, individual and um, a line called calamus that is quite known in the area um, and he tracked uh, almost twice a year, he would do a track of approximately 70 kilometers uh, that would take him two days to do that move. Uh, but such moves are, are kind of the, the odd ones and it's not what you see on a daily basis. Um, and then it really depends on the, on the habitat they live in. Um, in the crater, lions don't move very much. They, they barely just roll over and grab a zebra and, and stay put. Um, Whereas other poor ranges, they, they may have to travel, you know, numerous kilometers, 10, 20 uh, a day, perhaps for, for water and food. Wow. wow. Okay. Um, so so I just want the audience to know that, you know, we've lost Tandiwe to some technical difficulties, but we're trying to get her back on screen. Uh, oh, maybe she's joining us now. All right. Tandiwe. <laughs> Give us a thumbs up if you're with us. You can hear us. Cool. Okay, great. While we have you, yes, we have a question for you. We, so the question is, um, it's the, the 
the question says, I think it's hard to track lion movements in thick, in such thick bush. Um, actually, sorry, it's a little cut off question. Perhaps you can tell us about how your team actually tracks lions across the landscape. What methods do you use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually, you know, that statement on there is a really true one because um, as we know, lions move and live in diverse landscapes. So if it's in really thick, dense bush, it's a combination of different methods that allow us to monitor these animals. So we have satellite collars on about 22 to 23 prides on year by on a year by year basis. And so for the ones that we have satellite collars for, it's a combination of getting locations um, every morning, sharing them out with the team, and then they go out um, in, we use Land Rovers. And so they'll drive to the location and then try and see where they can pick up um, a signal for that particular pride. It does involve a good amount of off-roading and then also driving just through thick, dense uh, vegetation and to, to, to eventually see the groups. But yeah, once you finally find them, it's usually quite rewarding and you can collect valuable information about, you know, their productive status of different members of the group, the survival um, of different individuals. As we know, there's sex and age specific um, influences on the survival of the own. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work and the team does put in lots and lots of, of hours, but with the help of tech and really rugged vehicles, we're able to do the work. Great. Uh, Peter, so tell us a little bit about the importance of conserving lions for the rest of the ecosystem and the other species and wildlife that share that landscape? Yeah, so so lions are a, a keystone species, they're a top predator, so their, their presence introduces an important balance into ecosystems and prevents certain species from gaining predominance over others and essentially ensures that, that there's a a balance in, in the system because if you take top predators out you, you you'll tend to see that certain certain species will increase in numbers and 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 that will happen at the expense of others so it helps to regulate competition among prey species and therefore also helps to prevent um overgrazing and other other issues that result in mass die-offs of prey populations in the event of drought, among other effects mm, okay Jean, there's a question from Alice there that says, um, is the best model for lion recovery something like the African Parks Frankfurt Zoological Society type model that manages a whole park with individual species management subcontracted to specialist groups? So perhaps to kind of paraphrase that, I would say, you know, what are the different types of, of co-management models that are out there and what are some of the, the benefits to each? Yeah, I mean, I don't, there's definitely, you know, a lot of pros and, and always cons to every model. Um, you know, the, 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 I think a strong kind of pro of the, the model that we adopt is that holistic nature, but also the long-term vision. Um, conservation takes a lot of time for us to really see results and have success. Um, and you know the, the the partnerships that we enter into are normally 20 years or more um but that isn't to say that that other models so so a different model is is what what we normally refer to as a kind of technical or financial support role um whereby a an ngo or an external party will will support a project in an aspect um but not looking at the, you know, not supporting and the management on a, in a holistic way. Um, and often if, if kind of the, the base resources that are available to an area or the, the, the capacity in an area is relatively strong, but the area maybe needs support or expertise in certain areas, then that, that sort of technical or financial support model works really well. Um, Whereas often the, the kind of long-term holistic management is, is really good in areas where there's maybe been a broader breakdown in support or just lack of resources from a state level. 
um, you know, that, that, that more holistic approach enables much more investment into the area. Um, so I think it just depends on, on each specific case, what, what support that area is getting both from a state level and from other, other avenues, um, and, and then seeing which model fits best. Great, thanks. So we're, we're close to time, and I'd like to just ask uh, Tandy the final question. Uh, so, Tandy, tell us what um, people often ask me, like, I, I, if I live in America, how can I help? Like, what would be valuable for me to do from where I am? So what, do you, what, do you, what message do you have for somebody in terms of how they might be able to, to make a difference for Lions? Um, so in addition to, you know, supporting projects on the ground, either, you know, directly or through initiatives like, like the Lion Recovery Fund, um, what is required is greater awareness regarding the status of lions in Africa. Um, so having as much, as many people as possible know what is really the scenario for the king of the jungle. And I think it's something Pete, touched on earlier regarding the fact that people think lions are okay because you know when you go to these huge um, protected areas that have got relatively high concentrations of the species you might think that okay no problem I went on safari three times and I saw lions every day but there's actually a lot going on um, behind the scenes so getting this information as much as possible out there and then factual information more importantly Great. Thank you. And thank, thank all of you. Um, look, this has been a, a really great hour. I've loved it. Um, I think it's a really cool way to spend World Lion Day and to, to get deep into these issues. So, so thanks for taking the time and, and joining us. Um, I, I want to, to encourage everybody watching to please go and support each of the organizations. And the information uh, uh, for each organization is available on the and beyond website. So please follow them on social media if you can. Um, thank you for tuning in. I think that, that this has been a really excellent way to give us an all, a perspective about all the different issues facing lions across Africa. Uh, it's clear that the challenge to keeping lions thriving in the wild across Africa is immense, but there are a lot of really great people doing everything they can to, to make sure that happens. Um, and we've really got to ask ourselves, right? What does the world stand to lose if we lose the lion? So I think that everybody, no matter where you are in the world, you can make a difference, you can pitch in. If you're able to, please consider making a donation to the conservation groups that were represented today. Um, and if you can't make a donation, you can at least help spread the word about lions and the serious threat they're facing. Um, share, share the news on social media, tell, the fr tell your friends, all of that good stuff. And then if you're able to, please travel back to Africa. I think that uh, you know COVID has hit the continent and the tourism sector so hard. And it's been a loss of really critical revenue to local communities, as well as conservation groups that really rely on tourism dollars. So if you're able to, please consider planning your next safari. All of this, uh, the recording for today's event is gonna be posted on the And Beyond website, as well as their YouTube page. So check that out. Again, lastly, I wanna thank And Beyond. I wanna thank all of our guests and all of you for tuning in today. So uh, until the next World Lion Day, stay safe, be well, and stay wild. <laughs>